Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the talk tonight, which is a Frank H.T. Rhodes Class of 56 talk. Dr. Temple Grandin is our guest under that program. She has been coming here. Uh, this is her fifth visit and, unfortunately, her last under that program. Um, I'm Joe Regenstein. I'm a food science professor. I've been working with Temple for many, many years on issues of uh, animal welfare, particularly around slaughter and religious slaughter. Um, and so I'm her host, and I was asked tonight to do the introductions, which I'm going to try to keep short because you don't really want to hear me. Um, Temple um, got her uh, undergraduate degree from Franklin Pierce College uh, in psychology and then went on to get a, both a master's in animal science from Arizona and a PhD uh, in animal science from University of Illinois. Um, she is now at Colorado State, uh, where she is a professor of animal science. She also has, uh, works there half time uh, and has Temple Grandin, a Grandin livestock, um, where she works very closely with uh, many, many facets of the industry uh, around the world. Uh, she's a prolific author of both scientific papers and scientific books. She has all the qualifications a professor needs. Uh, she also has what is sometimes looked askance in the academic world. She has two books who have made the New York Times bestseller list. Um, she also, um, for many of you, is uh, the subject of this month's very, very unique and special HBO program with Claire Danes, uh, who's half her size, but otherwise has done uh, a wonderful job of capturing Temple. Uh, we're looking forward. One of the other big events is tomorrow night, uh, where the movie is going to be shown with uh, discussion afterwards with Temple and Scott Ferguson, who is a Cornellian who was the producer of the move of the of the movie, um, and he will be here. Hopefully, I, I don't know his flight arrangements. Uh, we have our fingers crossed. Uh, and as a ticketed, charged event, because it's being shown through Cornell Cinema, we know there may be a few tickets left. Um, so um, without further ado, I'd like to present Temple, who's going to be talking on animal behavior uh, and animal welfare issues. Please join me in welcoming Temple. <laughs> It's really good to be here. Hope this mic's going to work because I like to be able to walk around. Ooh, that's awfully loud. Okay, hope that's uh, better. Uh, let's just get in and start talking about animal behavior. You know, and animal behavior is really, really important because when you take, you know, dogs and cats, half of the animals that are given up are given up because they uh, go to the bathroom on things, they chew up things or bite people, you know, behavior problems. And, and uh, one of the things I want to try to do is to help you figure out how to um, handle animals better. Any animal, you have to do some veterinary thing on it. A calm animal is easier to handle. And when they get uncalm, they're usually getting scared. They're usually getting fearful. And some people might say, well, that's anthropomorphic. Well, the circuits in the animal's brain that show that they have fear were mapped 25 years ago. You know, one of the big problems we've got in science is neuroscience has their literature over here, veterinarians have their literature here, animal behavior has their literature over here, psychology has their literature, another set of journals, and nobody communicates across journals. So if you get an animal all scared, it's going to take half an hour for it to calm down. So let's not get it all scared. Now, to understand animals, it's a sensory-based world, a world of vision, a world of sound, smell, taste, and touch. And I get asked all the time, how does autism help me with animals? See, the thing is, I am a visual thinker. Language just narrates the pictures in my imagination. And the movie did an absolutely fantastic job of showing my visual thinking mind. There's a scene in there where the word horse is said, and a whole bunch of pictures of specific horses come up. There's no generalized horse concept in my mind. There's only specific ones. And when I wrote one of my earlier books, Thinking in Pictures, I was shocked to find out that other people didn't think in pictures the same way I did. So I'm very, very fascinated with this whole thing of different kinds of minds. I'm a photorealistic visual thinker. 
had a horrible time with algebra. Never got to try geometry and trig. That was a gigantic mistake. Another kind of mind is kind of the pattern thinker. These are your computer programmers, your engineers, sometimes reading's a problem, chemists, the, that category. And then you have your word thinkers. But there's different kinds of thinking. And different kinds of thinking are good at doing different things. And sometimes the different kind of thinkers need to be working together. But you've got to imagine a world where it's detailed sensory impressions. And here's a picture that a young autistic boy sent to me to show how he thinks in pictures. It's literally movies in your head. And for you younger people here, that's 16 millimeter movie reels in the head. <laughs> uh, kind of outdated technology there. And I've had teachers say to me when I've done autism talks, how can I get the movies out of the kid's head? Well, you can't. That's just how he thinks. And I had a brain scan done with tensor imaging that measures great big, huge fiber bundles. And I have a gigantic big fiber bundle about that big around up here. Huge graphics card in my head. And there's other people um, on the autism spectrum on where, they're, where they don't have this because they're not a visual thinker. You know, there's just different kinds of minds are good at doing different things. If you want to understand an animal, you've got to get away from language. If you're working with um, children that are nonverbal, you need to get away from language. Another thing in autism that a lot of people ignore are the sensory issues, sound sensitivity, touch sensitivity. You'll see in the movie that I couldn't stand to be touched. I can't wear scratchy clothes against my skin. Now, the thing is, if you didn't have a little bit of autism genetics, we wouldn't have any electricity. Because Tesla, who invented the power plant, would probably be diagnosed with autism today. Einstein would, is a little bit on the spectrum. And then, of course, what about all the people out at Silicon Valley? And I'm sure you've all seen that show, uh, Big Bang Theory, and Sheldon. Sheldon of Big Bang Theory? Well, I saw lots of people out there that are the grown-up Sheldons, and they are very, very successful people. Now, there's some research on, in people that shows that language covers up visual thinking, math thinking, some of these other kinds of thinking because of the type of Alzheimer's disease called frontal temporal lobe dementia, where the frontal cortex is wrecked and the language is wrecked. And this beautiful picture, which was published in the journal Neurology, was done by a patient that got frontal temporal lobe dementia. So this came out for about four years, and then the brain gets completely trashed. You know, and the visual parts of the brain are the most sort of strongest parts. Now, when you're working with animals, I want you to get very, very observant. I try to work on teaching people to be observant. Look at the ear on the zebra and the horse. They're looking at each other with the ear. The other ear is on me taking the picture. See, in your grazing animals, in your prey species animals, the ears can work independently. One ear can point that way. The other ear can point over that way. Dogs and cats, the ears are yoked together. What's the animal looking at? If you see the eyes popping out and you see the whites of the eyes, that animal's getting scared. That's actually been documented in cattle. Now, in my first work with cattle, I got down in the chutes to see what they were seeing. Now, you see how that animal coming out is looking right at that blob of sunlight. You see anything that's contrast, something that moves rapidly. And in my work that I did with the slaughterhouses, People were always asking me, do they know they're going to get slaughtered? Well, I had to answer that very early in my career. So I went to the Swift plant, and in the movie, they had to make it Abbott. You know, the legal department says you can't use Swift because that's still a real brand. So it's Abbott instead of Swift, but we'll call it Swift tonight. So I would, uh, I would go over to the um, Swift plant and watch the cattle. Then I'd go out to the big feed yards where they were vaccinating hundreds and hundreds of cattle just as fast as they'd go through the Swift plant. And they behave the same way in both places. If they knew they were going to get slaughtered, they would be a lot wilder at the plant trying to get out, but they weren't trying to get out. And I found if you get rid of the things that distract them, things like a little piece of chain hanging down. Well, I don't know how many facilities I have to get a little, take out the little pieces of chain. I've been doing these talks for 35 years, and I still have to put a stupid slide in here of chains hanging down <laughs> because people don't take them out. And some research done in Dr. Nancy Minshew's lab in Pittsburgh showed that the normal human mind drops out the details, where the autistic mind gets all of the details. 
You know, in fact, um, one of the things I find is always a hassle when I have people ask me questions about their child or they ask me questions about what their dog or their horse is doing is they tend to ask a question that's way too vague. Like, my child has a behavior problem. Well, what do you mean by it's a behavior problem? Or my dog's crazy. Well, I can visualize a dog crazy and excited and happy and wagging his tail when you come home. Or maybe some big Rottweiler that's going to, you know, bite your head off. You know, maybe either one of those could be crazy. Because the thing is, is when I talk about the dog or the child, I have to make a picture. And I've got to ask the parents enough questions or the owner of the dog enough questions so I can start to make a picture of what he's actually doing. Otherwise, I can't, you know, fix the problem. I'm always having to say, be specific. Give me a specific example. And I'd get down in the shoots to see what the animals are seeing. Look at how you got all the stripes on them with the shadows. Sunny days are worse. Cloudy days, you won't have those shadows. Or maybe the sun is in a different direction, you have no shadows. You wanna, you've got to be looking at these things. And when I first started out looking at these things, people looked at me like I was absolutely, totally crazy. You mean you're getting down in there to see what cattle are seeing? That's just completely nuts. And how do you form a concept when I've got all of these pictures floating around in my head? All these things like Google for images. Well, my mind works exactly like Google works. You know, you put a keyword in, then it brings up a whole lot of pictures that are on subject, and then it gradually gets off a of subject. Well, who do you think made Google? <laughs> and so it's set up to put things into categories. And this is a really neat picture that a little boy that has um, autism drew to show how he's sorting cat and dog pictures into different boxes. You know, it's sorting visual images. So how did I figure out that a cat wasn't a dog? I did it by size originally, but then after our next door neighbor's got a dachshund, I had to find a visual feature that every dachshund has that none of the cats have got. They all have the same nose shape. Another way I could sort them is barking or meowing. Now, one of the things that drives me absolutely crazy in both my work with livestock and my work with autism is people don't know how to troubleshoot and put information into categories. Okay, let's say I got a problem out at this meat plant, and they're using the electric prods too much on the cattle, and, and equipment's not working right. The first thing I got to do is say, do I have an equipment problem or a people problem? And I find that most people have a very difficult time sorting that out. There's a tendency to want to go in, oh, we'll change all the equipment. Oh, latest technology. And I have found that people are more willing to buy the thing than to do the management. Now, the movie is all back in the 70s. And that was back in the days where I thought I could fix everything with equipment. Now I've found that I can only fix about half of things with equipment. And you get the same problem in troubleshooting a problem maybe with a nonverbal person with autism when we've got a very, very severe behavior problem, like maybe self-abuse, something really bad. And I say, look, you've got to figure out, do I have a biological problem or do I have a problem that's just behavior? And if it's biological, it could be some hidden painful medical thing that he can't tell you about, like he's got acid reflux problem, uh, or he's got sensory overload, a fire alarm went off in that room last week and now he's afraid to go in there. And there's some people on the spectrum that are so sensitive that they go in a big supermarket, they feel like the inside speaker at the rock concert, and they just can't tolerate it. i got to rule out sensory and painful medical problem. Then I can start figuring out, is it purely behavior? Like frustration, not being able to communicate, getting attention, or getting out of doing something. Those are your three main motivations for behavior. Now, a horse makes a separate category for a man on his back and a man on the ground. You see, that's a different picture. Cattle do the same thing. You can have cattle that are absolutely tame, handled on horse, and then when a man gets on the ground, they scatter and run away because they haven't been trained to that. Dogs do the same thing. On the leash, off the leash, two different categories. Maybe when I'm on the leash, I protect my owner. When I'm off the leash, I can go and play with other dogs. You see, the animal mind makes categories. They, I've talked about this horse before, he's scared to death of black hats. Because when somebody abused him, he was looking at a black hat. 
cowboy, white cowboy hat was fine. And when I put the hat down on the ground, it was less scary. Then the closer the hat got up here, the more scary it got. And an animal will often make an association with a sound or something he was seeing right when the bad thing happened. Okay. All right. Now, there's a possibility that these two objects here, especially if I got them near my head, that they may also trigger the fear memory. You know, big purse and a black neck pillow. Because it's a picture, and the, and the horse actually, like, matches. Do I have a match? And these fears can generalize in a kind of a visual, specific way. I'll give you another example. Okay? Dogs often get afraid of the place where they were hit by a car. Um, one type of bit may make a fear, and another type of bit is fine, because it feels different. They know the voice of the good and bad people. When we worked on training antelopes to cooperate at the zoo with their veterinary work, the veterinarian that had shot them with a dart gun, he could never handle them. They knew his voice, they knew his walk, they knew everything about him. Okay, now that's a really awful kind of bit. I went on the internet to look up these bit pictures. There's really some dreadful, awful bits on the internet that they just, you just shouldn't be using. And this is a really nasty bit. And uh, if a horse, this can really cut up a horse's mouth. And the problem that you have, if, you, if this is, the horse has been abused with this, then he's likely to be afraid of any jointed bit, even one that's a lot nicer. Okay, you've got a jointed bit there that's nicer. Okay, now you've got another type of bit that's one piece. Now, the one piece bit he may be fine with. Now, if you hold these in your hand and shut your eyes, you have different feeling pictures. Another problem you can sometimes get with horses is bucking when you change gates. You see, walk, trot, and canter is a different feeling picture at each gate. And if you introduce something new too quickly, the horse is going to panic. Here's another horse that got deathly afraid of long, straight things. Okay, he'd be afraid of all of these things. Broom handles, canes, microphone stands, shovel handles, especially when those things were vertical. Okay, there's an animal being shown with a show stick, horizontal show stick. And it's possible maybe that won't set it off. You see, it's very specific, but it can generalize. I mean, when you think of all those straight things there, they're all long, straight things. What I'm trying to do is to get you to think in another way. And if anybody's in here that works with uh, you know, kids or adults with autism, this is going to apply. Now, some people on the autism spectrum are auditory thinkers because they have problems in their visual system. And when they go to read, the print jiggles on the paper. They hate driving at night. They hate fluorescent lights because they can see the flicker. And these people tend to be auditory thinkers, not language-based so much, but auditory really tuned into sound. Another horse was afraid of naked white saddle pads. Now, when you put tack on top, you see you have a different picture. If you put tack on top, then it was all right. Now, these were just some pictures I found on the internet. Um, but what I'm trying to do is to get you to think about these things in a sensory way. And one of the things that's been learned about fear memories is very difficult to erase. We've got to work on preventing these problems. It's very important that an animal's new experiences, you know, first experiences with new things be good. New horse trailer, the new, uh, you know, uh, barn, new chute, whatever the thing is. You also want to make sure that, uh, you know, you take a young autistic kid into a new place, like a new school, we don't just get blasted out with the sensory stuff. You know, you gradually get them used to it because bad first experiences, you get a fear memory there, it gets really, really hard to get rid of. And, and fear memories have been mapped. You know, now scientists are working on some ways to disrupt them, such as uh, giving the animal beta blockers, the um, uh, blood pressure medicine, propanolol, that uh, tends to uh, erase some of the aspects of the fear memory. Now, this just shows you, this is a chart I always like to show, to show people just how bad rough handling of animals is. You know, you got rough cattle up there, really rough handling. You got a lot of stress. You got dairy cows down there with a lot less stress. You see, when an animal voluntarily does something, you have a whole lot less stress. When you force it, it gets scared. And the animals with a flighty, flighty, excitable temperament, they get more scared. 
Now, one of the things I've constantly go round and round with wildlife people is they go, oh, we netted those deer for only five minutes. That can't be very scary. And I said, well, what if somebody just, like, knocked you down and took your wallet? Maybe it took 30 seconds, but you're going to be pretty stressed out over it. <laughs> and here are the students uh, training uh, antelopes to cooperate with their blood sampling. Very flighty animal. We had to introduce each new thing very carefully, like we're opening a sliding door, you move a sliding door only this much, and they orient. That's all you do today. Next day, it's two inches. Very, very hyper-specific in their thinking. You know, you train, uh, you train the animals to tolerate the big, uh, a big ice chest. You can't just assume that another big ice chest is going to be fine. And we had some problems with scaring cattle out on the movie set. Um, there's a scene in the movie... Uh, where Claire Danes is sitting watch out on the lake looking at the uh, little pond and the cattle come down to the edge of the pond and they wanted to get a publicity picture with me and Claire and that reddish brown heifer that was there. Well, she was supposed to be a trained halter broke heifer, trained for show. Well, we go, I go down, I kneel down by this heifer and I don't want to get her to lick my face and all of a sudden she was almost on top of me and I turned around and a grip had moved a four by eight white reflector board, just Shh. And I said, don't move it. And uh, he moved it again, and I said, and then I'm not gonna say what I said after that because it wasn't very nice. <laughs> um, but the thing is, they assumed that since the animal was trained to vehicles and everything, all the different trucks and everything, she'd be fine about four by, she'd be good with four by eight white panels. No way. We were really lucky she wasn't on top of me. You know, that's just an example of the specificity of thinking. What happened with the white panel, they just had it sitting on the ground, four by eight panel, and they just went, that's all he did. Little short, rapid movement. She just about lost it. So even though that was a tame animal, it hadn't been trained to the specific big object that was very, very different than trucks and cars. And they had some big white trucks that, you know, would have looked sort of like that panel. Here are some principles for calm restraint. You know, for any animal, when you take them to the veterinarian, non-slip flooring, I cannot emphasize that enough. Let's give the dog something to stand on that's non-slip. I know a lot of times the veterinarians don't want to clean that, so I have the owner bring in a bath mat from home with a rubber backing that the puppy's familiar with, and then he's not going to be sliding around. And animals panic when they slip, or you have a horse or something, and he's going like this, this just makes them panic, absolutely panic. And in my work with the slaughter plants, I mean, I'm going in there, we're putting rubber mats in the chutes, and we're putting steel rods in them, because if the animal's going like this, it just makes them panic. It's amazing how you can stop a lot of that with a good non-slip floor. And then there's some of these large kind of, you know, gawky kind of dogs that they get on certain types of floor surfaces, they can't walk. And they're saying, what's wrong with the dog? I said, I can't walk on it. And then you're punishing it for that? You know, this is where you've got to figure out. I mean, I don't think it, that it can physically walk on it. And the thing is, just a little bit of a difference in the finish on the floor is going to be the difference between that foot slipping and it not slipping. No jerky motion. Jerky motion like this scares. There's also an optimal pressure for holding an animal. Even if you're holding a little animal, people tend to squish it too tight. You've got to sort of make it feel held, and you've got to support it. Don't let it feel like it's off balance. That makes an animal panic. Fear of falling is a primal, primal fear. He thinks he's going to fall, he's going to get scared. Animals definitely have emotions. We already talked about fear, and in the first chapter of Animals Make Us Human, Katherine Johnson and I talk about animal emotions. And uh, let's just talk about some of the science here, because I've been accused of being anthropomorphic. And I can tell you one part of chapter one I really worked on a lot was the footnotes in the reference list. And I went back and I looked up the original papers. So when people say that chapter is a bunch of rubbish, I have got the original papers all the way back to the original experiments to show that, yes, they really do have emotions. Let's just look at a few simple things. Prozac works on dogs. And the things that it works for are separation anxiety and fear and uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder where they're chewing up their foot. The neurotransmitters in animal brains are the same. And in mammals, the, uh, all the emotion circuits are located in the subcortex. 
the same in all mammals. The only difference is, is that in us, it's filtered through this vast, complicated cortex. So we can express it much more complexly than maybe a dog can. Here are the core emotional circuits. These are fully mapped. There's fear. That's what enables animals to survive in the wild. There's rage. There's separation anxiety. And separation anxiety and fear are separate, different emotional circuits. You can actually breed quail. This is the research of Fari over in France. And you can breed quail to be high fear, low separation, or high separation and low fear, or vice versa. The natural wild bird is high fear and high separation. And they did a very clever way to measure separation anxiety. They made a little moving sidewalk, and they'd measure how long the quail would, would walk on the moving sidewalk in the wrong direction to stay next to its buddies. But now you've got to have the emotion of going out and doing stuff, attraction to novelty, seeking novelty. Because if you just had these negative emotions, well, the animal would just stay under a bush and starve to death because it wouldn't go out and do anything. And there's actually a mechanism in the brain has actually been discovered. It's called the nucleus accumbens. And it can flip back and forth between fear or seeking. It flips either one way or the other. And then, of course, you've got sex. You've got the mother-young nurturing behavior. That's the oxytocin system. And then you have play. And this is... Um, just talking about the nucleus accumbens, already discussed that. Now, if I go and I put a clipboard out in the middle of a pen of cattle, they all come up to it. And Claire Daines did a really nice thing where she laid down a pen of cattle and they came up to her. And whenever I get interviewed about that, I say, you can try that. It must be done in a very large pen. So if something scares them, they can move away and never do it with bulls. They might do that. No bulls. But then when they, they come up to the clipboard, the wind blows the paper, and then they run away. And I used to call it curiously afraid, and I'd go, it's like a switch. Turns out that the switch now has been discovered. Now, when an animal orients like this, see how that deer's orient? It's looking at the camera, but look at that other ear. That other ear's watching something else. It orients when it hears something. And then it makes a decision, do I seek or do I flee? Or do I keep watching? Which way do I go? I had a very interesting experience, a scary experience. I was minding my own business, coming home from the airport, driving in the right-hand lane on the freeway, and this idiot passes me with a little low trailer and a big two-by-six about this long, slides off that trailer and starts to come across the road like this. I locked onto it like radar, and it slowed down like in slow motion, and I moved my car over, and I managed to straddle this board and avoid a really bad accident. I was totally calm. And then the instant I had successfully avoided the accident, the nucleus accumbens flipped, and I now had a giant fear. My heart was pounding out, and every swear word, which I will not repeat, was coming out of my mouth, just screaming and heart pounding. When you're, trouble, when you're troubleshooting a behavior, you've got to figure out what's motivating the animal. Is it fear? Is it uh, separation anxiety? Is it anger? I get asked all the time about, what do you think about Caesar Milan? Now, there's certain dogs he's very good with. You know, the real aggressive dogs, pit bulls, rottweilers. But he's done some stuff with fear dogs I thought was terrible. You know, I was just reading in his magazine that I picked up in the supermarket. I didn't buy it, but I read this one article in it in the supermarket. And he, um, you know, there was a dog afraid of thunderstorms. He says, well, you put it on a treadmill and make it run and run on a treadmill and blast it out with a sound effects record. I'm going, uh-uh. No, 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 no. That's, I don't think that's the way to handle that. Should the vet be present when you're working on your animal? It's going to depend, I mean, not the vet be present. Should the owner be present? Excuse me, should the owner be present? It's going to depend upon how the dog perceives it. If he's scared, then the owner probably should be there. If the dog thinks he's got to protect the owner against the vet, then maybe the owner should not be there and better be 10 miles down the road. So if it's a pit bull that belongs to the drug dealer, you want that owner 10 miles down the road. You don't want him in the waiting room because the dog will know the car hasn't left. What can we do to prevent abnormal behavior? We've got to work on preventing abnormal behavior, like a dog chewing up its paw or the leopard pacing. And a dog's chewing up its paw due to separation anxiety. Now, there's genetic differences in how well animals tolerate separation anxiety. Some are a lot worse than others. Some can handle being home alone, and others can't. 
I just talked to one lady. She's got three little pugs in her apartment, and they seem to do just fine. And those are small dogs, so they can get plenty of exercise. Okay, a single golden retriever or a Labrador alone in an apartment all day, very likely to have a chewed up foot, and he's going to eat everything in the apartment. And then you might wonder, why did he eat my favorite CD? The, the reason why he eats up the remote or your favorite shoe or your favorite CD is because that's the thing you touched the most. It's got your smell on it. You know, he's not going to eat the ones, the CD you never play. He's going to eat the one that you've, that's really got a whole lot of your scent on it. And, you know, we get concerned about a lot of animal welfare things. I, with farm animals, I get concerned about some of these poor dogs that are home alone all day. And maybe they need to go over to a next-door neighbor's house. And when I was a kid, all the dogs ran loose, no behavior problems, but we did have a lot of dogs killed by cars. That was the downside. Okay, what can we do about the leopard? We've got to give him something to do. The dog wants companionship. The leopard wants something to do. Okay, you might have a little gerbil, and he's digging, 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 digging. So you go, okay, let's give him some more dirt to dig in. He doesn't want dirt. He wants cover. He wants something he can get underneath because he has an instinctual fear of aerial predators. Well, you're not going to have any aerial predators in some kid's bedroom. The chicken wants a private place to lay her nest. She wants to get behind a barrier and hide. Now, you can measure how motivated is the chicken to get this thing that she wants. She'll stay off a of feed for a day and a half, two days, just to get a private nest box. That's something she wants. Dogs need lots of human companionship. You know, we have bred the dog to be this hypersocial animal, and they need lots of activities to turn on seeking things to do, like chasing the frisbee. Horses, we need to be really careful when we're, tr when we're training them and teaching them new things not to get them scared. And you have a really high-strung horse like an Arab, you can wreck that horse, you know, by introducing new things too quickly and doing it abusively. Also, this is an animal that spends hours a day grazing. So what do we do? We give it a concentrated feed. It eats up in five minutes. So what does it do with its mouth? It chews your barn down. So maybe the thing to do is to feed it hay. The problem is we've got to work on preventing these abnormal behaviors because they're very, very difficult to stop once they get started. And the polar bear, what does a polar bear do in nature? He walks, and he walks for miles and miles and miles and miles, seeking. So we've got to give him something to do. And at the uh, Central Park Zoo in New York, this is Gus, and he was wearing a hole through the concrete where he was walking around. And what they gave to Gus was a whole lot of barrels with different buoyancies. Some floated high in the water, some were almost, almost sinking. They put all these barrels in his pool. It looks like a big kiddie playpen. Doesn't look very attractive, but boy, Gus loves it. Animals reared alone can sometimes be really bad. Dogs reared alone, never been socialized to other dogs, they'll fight other dogs in a really bad way. It's very important that puppies be socialized to toddlers. You know, German Shepherds and Rottweilers, those big dogs, they better learn that this little kid it's a different picture, is a person too. But if you don't teach them what a toddler is, that could be potentially dangerous when they grow up. Dairy bulls have a really bad reputation for attacking people. And one of the reasons this happens is because they're reared, lots of times they're reared alone, away from their own kind. So they don't learn that they're cattle. And then when they grow up and the sex hormones kick in, they go, I gotta prove I'm the man. And instead of going out and doing it with the other bulls, he attacks the dairyman and then you've got a dead dairyman. I'm very, very concerned that a lot of animals just simply are not getting enough socialization, you know, with their own kind. You've got to get dogs out there, get them socialized with other dogs. You know, the problem is in some places, I don't know what it's like around here, but boy, in Fort Collins, we have draconian leash laws. You're not allowed to have your dog off your property, off the leash, even if you're right there with it. I think that's crazy. I went over to London, and you could have your dog out in the regular park off its leash. Now, in my work, farm animals, one of my biggest, biggest frustrations was I put in a really nice piece of equipment, and about 20% of my clients would run it right, but boy, I had about 25% of my clients where they'd regress back and just the worst bad behavior, and 
And it was just so frustrating. Build a nice system, have them tear it up and wreck it. And the thing is, they slipped back into this bad behavior, and they didn't even realize they were doing it. You know, the screaming would come back gradually, and the prodding of the animals would come back gradually. They'd slide into what I call bad becoming normal. You manage the things that you measure, and you've got to keep measuring it. And so right now, the biggest thing I've been working on is animal welfare audits done by large customers, like McDonald's, Safeway, big food service companies like Cisco Systems, things like that, and training their food safety teams on doing animal welfare audits. But they do it using a numerical scoring system. It isn't just somebody coming in there and saying, well, I think you, you, you know, do it properly. Well, what's do it properly mean? We count. How many animals got poked with the electric prodder? How many animals are mooing and bellowing their heads off? How many animals are falling down during handling? I can measure that kind of stuff. Now, when you're making up auditing measurements, there's kind of uh, three kinds of ways you can make variables. I can have things like how many cattle are mooing and bellowing during handling. I can count. And to pass the McDonald's audit on the AMI, American Meat Institute auditing system, you're only allowed to have 3% of the cattle out of 100 mooing and bellering. There's more than that's mooing and bellering during handling, you're going to fail the audit. It's, a, it's an animal-based outcome thing. Instead of telling them how to build the system, I'm going to tell them it's got to make certain scores. And these work just like traffic rules. They've worked extremely well. You can look at the entire system on... Um, on my website on grandon.com, or you can look on the American Meat Institute uh, website, uh, animalhandling.org. Now, you can also have bad practices you just ban. I worked with the OIE, with the World Animal Organization for Animal Health, on slaughter guidelines. And I said, there's some bad stuff we got to just ban. You know, people poke out the eyes of cattle. You just got to ban that. Absolutely just got to ban that. And then the old way of doing guidelines is what's called an engineering variable. You're telling them exactly how to build stuff. I'm getting away from that. But you still need to have a few engineering variables, maybe on some space requirements. Okay, here are some really simple measurements for animal handling. How many fall? How many are squealing or mooing? How many are running? I want livestock handled at a walk and a trot. I don't want them running. How many did you use the electric prodder on? How many run into stuff like fences and gates? I can measure that. Here are just some other measures of horses and cattle getting scared. And if you have horses and the eyes are bugging out, you see the whites of the eyes showing your animal's getting scared. See the tail switching, horses and cattle, they're getting more and more upset, quivering, heads held up high, looking around, nostrils are flaring out. He's getting excited. And the thing is, I can measure. Let's say I change something. I can add a light on the entrance of a chute. Animal, a lot of animals don't like to go into dark places. So I found with the slaughter plants, I'd go in and tape a light on the entrance of a chute. It was amazing how it improved the handling. Now, I had the people trained only use the electric prod on the pigs that balked. So I went 38% of the animals getting zapped down to 4%. All I did was put a light on a chute entrance. See, what I want to try to get people to do is I want you to use behavior, not force. And there's an example of the light. Also, I did things to eliminate reflections. And uh, sometimes I moved lights. I put up solid barriers so they didn't see things moving. And you can also have animals that are difficult to handle. One of my big concerns in animal welfare, both in dogs and in livestock, is what I call biological system overload. We push that cow to make milk. We push that pig to make more and more muscle until we get a lame, weak animal. You know, I, that's a real problem. And, and I can measure this at the plant, some of these animals that are are, uh, are difficult to move, but you dog people don't get off. Let's look at the bulldog. Smashed in face, all like this, he can barely walk. Well, that's just gotten more and more extreme over the years. They didn't look that way 40 years ago. Good guidelines. Now, if you're writing guidelines, I don't care what you're writing guidelines for. It could be for food safety, it could be for animal welfare, it could be uh, a whole lot of different things. Student conduct, it could be a whole bunch of things. What does proper mean? What does adequate mean? What does sufficient mean? I hate these vague guidelines. I've worked on training a lot of auditors. I don't know what they mean. 
I want to pick out the really important things to measure, directly observable things. OK, let's look at what a mess our educational system is in today. Well, people thought if we put the internet in all the schools, it'd make it wonderful. Well, it didn't. A lot of students have got lousy library skills. They don't even know how to use a search engine. And you know what? Let's look at things that maybe ought to be measuring. OK, kids graduate from high school. How many stay out of trouble with the law? And how many of them get and keep good jobs where there's some advancement? OK, they either go to college or they get and keep jobs where there's advancement. That's your ultimate measure, that they become a productive citizen. When I talk about measuring a critical control point, that's what I'm talking about. You figure out the relatively few important, you figure out a few critical control points that measure a multitude of sins, and not just get off an endless paperwork. OK, if I'm looking at farm animals, well, I want to measure things like, how many skinny dairy cows have I got? How many lame cows have I got? How many filthy, dirty animals? How many have got sores all over their legs? OK, and then organic, we've got to make sure they don't have external parasites. You know, bald spots on cattle, no, that's not OK. So we're going to look at coat condition. If they're indoors, what's the ammonia levels in the building? And then if, how much abnormal behavior is going on, especially destructive abnormal behavior, like tail biting. I can measure that. Now the thing, the reason why lameness is a good outcome measure is this is all the different things that can make a cow lame. All of these bad things here can make a cow lame. So if I go out in a dairy and they got, you know, 30% lame cows, I know I got a problem. You see, that's why lameness is a critical control point. What I want you to do is when you're trying to evaluate different things, is you want to try to figure out what are the relatively few important things to measure. But I can tell you, in animals, uh, animal welfare, lameness is, I don't care what species you have, lameness is important. Well, there's an example of ex some extreme right there. Uh, notice that the uh, fold on the nose is uh, coming over the nose. I look at that. Yeah, he's cute, but he's also a deformed freakazoid. <laughs> and if you, um, if you go back and you look at old sports pictures where bulldogs are the mascot, and whenever I go to school where Bulldogs are the mascot. I like to find their old sports pictures. And he doesn't look like this bulldog. Now, I've just got some examples over there of some of the things that can push the biology too much on the farm animals. But you overselect for single traits, you wreck your animal, and I don't care whether it's a dog or whether it's a pig or a cow. This is just some of the things, you, problems you can get, like in, in uh, dairy animals and pigs breeding for just extreme meat production, got a lot of lameness. We've got to get that cleaned up. The dairy cows are getting really skinny. Animals where they're overselected for single traits, they don't live very long. You can take two pretty blue-eyed dogs and put them together, and you've got deaf puppies. I don't think that's very pretty. And what happened to those pigs' ears? Well, another pig ate them. See, the problem is, is when we bred pigs to be lean and grow rapidly, unfortunately, there's another trait linked to that fighting, and excitability. Traits are linked in ways we don't expect. Really pretty. You go over selecting for that, you're going to have a pile of neurological problems. Don't put two of those together. We got a lot of, now that's some really nice dairy cows there. I should have got Cheryl to put a different picture in there. Those are real pretty dairy cows. But there are some dairy cows today that are only lasting for two years of milking. You spend two years raising a heifer, and then she's only good for two years of milking. Well, this is because we've just gotten single-mindedness on milk production. I don't know how they do their accounting. I don't understand how that can work from a financial standpoint. And there are just a few books. I always like to show a few books. Maybe I'm not supposed to be showing that this talk. And there's, um, there's my website, um, grandon.com. I've got lots and lots and lots of free information on, um, on grandon.com, especially on how to measure things. And the thing is, some of the things I've talked to you tonight about measurement, I want you to try to take some of these ideas and use them for other things. It might not even have anything to do with animals. What I'd like to do right now is I think I want to open it up and I want to have some really, really good discussion. I'm going to use this mic, and Joe's going to take this mic around in the audience. Hi. 
Is there an optimal method to give a cat a pill that won't upset the cat? <laughs> I currently just kind of tuck him under my arm and I use a, yeah. Hi. I have a relatively young saddlebred gelding who is on 20 acres of pasture but still finds the time to eat things he shouldn't. Like the cr uh, crib on the fences and. He doesn't like do the wind sucking, he just chews. Um, fence posts. Bike handlebars, bike seats. Oh, he no. got he got a hold of the tractor seat. Oh no! And we have a floating water heater in a bathtub, and he chewed through the electrical cord to the water heater. Well, is he still alive? He is still okay. alive, <laughs> miraculously. <laughs> but we're lucky. trying to figure out how to break that habit of chewing things he shouldn't, and it's probably linked to seeking. But well, I don't know. The thing on the water trough that that you know chewing now that, that you need to just get it covered up so he can't get into that. And he's chewing some rather odd things. I mean, most horses that are cribbers, you know, they'll just, you know, go for the boards and, you know, put their mouth down on the boards. Uh, what do you, uh, he's got plenty of pasture, and he's got good pasture. Yep. You see, some of these things get to be bad habits. Because I've seen a horse where um, he had access to a beautiful 10-acre pasture with nice grass on it, and he just stay inside the barn and crib, and the door to the barn was open, and he could go outside and, and the saddlebred was probably locked up in a stall, you know, in his previous life. And these things turn into kind of bad habits and addictions. And, and I hate to say it, we have to try to work on preventing some of these behaviors. Uh, you know, and it's kind of odd some of the stuff he's chewing, bike seats. That's, um, he's um, also chewed through lead ropes. If I'm riding him and we stop for too long, he'll nibble my feet. <laughs> the other problem with some of these horses, I found with the Dutch warm bloods, is they're very large, and a very large horse has to eat a lot. So they seem to be a lot more mouthy. Like the Holstein cow, in order to give out a lot of milk, she's got to um, uh, eat a lot. And Holstein cattle actually have more chews per minute than beef cattle do. You know, and I don't think anybody deliberately selected the Holstein cow for more chews, but in order to get that milk production, she's got to take in a lot of feed. And, and you, know, this, you know, your horse is one of the larger horses and 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 you see breed for big horses they got you breeding for big appetite and uh, some of these things can really be a problem I mean bike seats I <laughs> want that I'm I don't know maybe I ought to put some pepper sauce or something on the <laughs> on the bike seat and then you leave it alone I don't want to put something aversive on the water trough because I don't want to do anything to interfere with drinking that needs to just be mechanically covered up in a way where he can't get into the wiring on the water trough. But something like bike seats, as far as, or the tractor seat, as far as I'm sorry, I never want him touching those ever again. I'd want him, I'd like him to stay away from those. We moved everything away, but just he keeps seeming to find new things. All well, does he have particular things he likes to chew? Uh, but does, what about the grass? 
Um, he was very skinny for a couple of years. I got him, and he was about 16 hands and 800 pounds. Oh, that is skinny. And was feeding him about half of a five-gallon bucket a day of sweet feed mixed with beet pulp, mixed with, like, a supplement. Now, does he have plenty of, of just some dry grass hay? And lots of hay and all and of lots that. Lots of hay. Okay, that's good. By the time he good. was seven, which was two years later, he finally was a normal weight. And... Um, was able to stop feeding him as much, but he just... And now he's now is he still chewing stuff now as much? Yep. He's still just as bad? Yep. Well, what about if you just put some sacrifice boards on, <laughs> up like a fake fence up, sacrifice boards that he can just chew? I know some people have done that. Something that would be real attractive for him to chew and you just replace it periodically. <laughs> uh, you want to make sure he's not going to eat the splinters and, and get sick, but... Granted, I had a question about um, small-scale slaughter. There was a recent system that I saw in a movie, um, a documentary called uh, Food Inc., where basically it showed a particular farmer from Polyface Farm who had a very small um, uh, slaughter area where he had basically had the cones uh, about the three chickens? feet. For, chi for chickens, yes. Well, that, that small-scale thing with chickens, that will work on a small scale. I was actually just... But it will not work when you scale it up. I was curious just about the, the psychology behind um, having, for instance, animals seeing or being able to see or smell or hear, uh, the, I guess, the slaughter of other animals, and whether it's, it's different between uh, different species. Um. Well, there's been some work done, actually. It was a paper done. It was published in a journal called Animal Welfare on, uh, you know, slaughtering pigs in front of other pigs, and they don't seem to get what's going on as long as things stay calm and low stress. Now, one thing I've found anecdotally is if the head is removed in front of other animals, then they, then at least pigs and cattle realize something is drastically wrong. I mean, they, um, I know a, one scientist went and put a calf head out in the middle of the pasture and then really weirded out the cattle and <laughs> at another place, a stuffed deer head made some cattle go berserk. You know, then they realize something is totally dreadfully wrong. You know, now, you know, some people think we ought to just do all the slaughtering, you know, like, like those chickens. On a small scale, something like that can work, but the problem is if you scale it up on any large size, you have the filthiest mess you can imagine. You'd have no way of cleaning that. You would just have a mess. And, and um, if you look at Michael Pollan's book, um, Omnivore's Dilemma, uh, you know, uh, Michael Pollan went and visited Joel Salatin, and that's where that was being taken place, and he asked Joel, what do you think about the, pity, the people in the cities? How are we going to get enough chicken for them? And he kind of says, well, I don't like cities. Well, that's not being very realistic. You see, and something that you can do on a small scale like that won't work on a large scale. You'd have a filthy, dirty public health disaster. So is there any proof that, or any uh, proof against the fact that animals, um, I guess, don't, simply don't know what's going on? If like a, a larger animal, a smarter animal, like a, um, a cow or a pig were to see one of its uh, they don't species. seem to understand, you know, like you shoot an animal in front of another animal. They don't seem to really understand that. Uh, now, if you, you, there is a stress, fear, smell stuff that can come out, but that takes about 15 minutes to come out. You have to have some really bad app and like a flipped over backwards in the chute. He's stuck in there for 15 or 20 minutes, and then the other cattle aren't going to go near that where he is urinated and he's slobbered. I've seen that happen, but I've seen a lot of animals shot in front of other animals, and... They kind of don't understand what's happened as long as it's not dismembered in front of the other animal. Now, I did see some video on a mobile slaughterhouse uh, going out, the bison, and the first few animals they did were really good, but then they got to chasing them with a truck, and that, that, um, that was not so good. You know, the important thing is to keep things very, very calm, because if animals get... Like if you poke animal, cattle with electric prod a whole bunch of times, five minutes before, before they're slaughtered, they get, very, um, they get tougher meat. And pigs, if you, you know, go after them with electric prods and get them jammed in shoots and get them squealing, their lactate levels will go up, and that gives you pale, soft meat. That last five minutes is very, very, very critical. You can, you can wreck pork in that last five minutes. Now, what you did on the handling out on the farm, that doesn't, you get bruises from that. 
but the lactate levels from the farm, that actually goes down and goes away. But the, uh, that last five minutes, you want to be doing things very, very calmly. I, also, I have one more question. I saw your YouTube video about, um, I think it was uh, pneumatic stunners yes. for cattle. And I was wondering if you could um, comment on the practice of ritual slaughter where they don't use um, stunners at all, whether there's a way of knowing um, if pain levels are the same or whether they're, um, whether they're enhanced. Because I know that in, in, uh, in those circles, there's a lot of claims, and I don't think they're based on any science where they say, you know, a quick reduction in blood to the brain reduces pain. And, and really, I, I haven't heard anyone scientifically come out and, and say anything for sure. Well, first of all, you got to look at, at um, pain versus, you know, how long it stays conscious. Okay, if you shoot an animal with a captive bolt stunner, drives a pin this far into the head, that gun is well-maintained, that will kill the animal instantly by shattering the brain. Or you can use electric stunning where you pass a... High, high amperage electric current through the brain that will instantaneously cause an epileptic seizure, which makes the, usually the pig or the lamb, that's what it's usually used on, instantly insensible. And I have some videos up on YouTube that actually show that stuff. You can type in Temple Grandin cattle, Temple Grandin pigs. Um, now you take on ritual slaughter, you've got two issues here. How do you hold and restrain your animal and slaughter without stunning where unconsciousness is not instantaneous? And cattle take longer to, um, to lose uh, consciousness than sheep and goats. Sheep and goats will lose consciousness probably, uh, you know, three or four seconds after you cut them. Cattle, it's going to be, you know, 15 or 20 seconds because cattle have more arteries going up in the back of the neck. Now, is there pain during the cut? A lot of that's going to depend upon the kind of knife that's used. In uh, kosher slaughter, uh, there's a special long knife that's used, very sharp, does not you know, short knives dig in like this, and that definitely causes pain. It'll make, I've seen sheep struggle when they will cut with something like that. Uh, but do they feel pain uh, during the cut? When they use a special kosher knife correctly, and you have the animal held in a restraining chute that holds it in a standing, comfortable position, they don't appear to react to the cut. You know, now there's some plants, because there's a Humane Slaughter Act exemption that hang live animals up by the ankle, and that's definitely stressful. You know, you have to separate how you hold it from the cut. Now, there's been some new research done in New Zealand where they used a, about a nine-inch long knife on 400-pound calf and cut the throat and using a new EEG method, say the calf feels pain. Now, the problem is the way the cut was done was not well described because if you let the wound close back up, that's going to hurt and that's properly done kosher slaughter, that doesn't happen. Also, they use the machine-sharpened knife. That might, you know, might possibly have an effect. Um, now, there's some, you see, in Jewish slaughter, you've got a special long knife that's required. In the Muslim slaughter, they don't have as strict requirements for the knives, and I've seen some very bad halal slaughter. I was in some plants up in Canada, and they were trying to cut veal calves with a knife that was like a butter knife. And, and that was just, you know, completely hideous. You know, the thing about ritual slaughter is to do it with an acceptable level of welfare requires a lot more attention to detail than stunning them. Stunning them, the most important thing is you've got to maintain your equipment. When I did, did a survey on that for the USDA back in 1997, the number one problem was they didn't maintain the stun gun. They just didn't take care of it. You know, now with all the auditing going on, plants are now measuring it on test stands and they're doing, you know, documented maintenance and that's gotten a lot better. And okay, right here. With deaf animals. Um, I... Well, well, yeah, a deaf animal, you're going to have to try to, rep you, you know, you got you could teach it visual commands. You know, it's not, you know, if it's totally stone deaf, um, it's not going to respond to sound. You're going to have to give it some other way to communicate. You've taught him five signs? Well, the thing is, is, uh, you know, you lose one sense, other senses tend to get heightened, like in a blind person, for example, um, in a blind roommate when I was in college, and she's shown really nicely in the movie, and and I have a live in a visual world. She lives in a world of sound detail and touch detail and what she touches on the ground with her cane. And, and it was just amazing. Like when she would go to class, 
someone would have to just lead her around once to her classes. And then she knew the way by the sound and by the feeling of her cane rubbing on the sidewalk. And she'd cross a busy intersection. I said, well, how do you know about the cars making the left turns? You know, they're making the turns. And she says, I just listen. And I'm going, whoa. And she'd go out there across this big intersection, just really confident. And the question is, just so I'm clear on this issue of animals and emotions, you're saying there's a scientific or a physiological basis for what you call these core emotions in all mammals? Yes. Um, any other emotions that humans would say or ascribe to animals, would you say they... Well, let's, give, let's, be, let's not be vague and give me specific examples. Jealousy, um, feelings hurt, um, guilty, shame, embarrassment. I mean, well, these are all human about, emotions. A thing about emotions. some of these things, you know, sometimes guilty is also, you know, could also be fearful. Uh, you know, he's, you come back home after this dog, the dog's pooed in the house, and uh, the dog's slinking around the front door when you, when you get back home because he knows dog poo on the rug is equals trouble. <laughs> I, I think some of these things are, um, animals definitely have kind of a, I don't know if you call it jealousy, but, you know, if you handle subordinate and the dominant, you're not giving the dominant one his due, he might attack the subordinate one. Um, the thing you have to look at is animal emotions are simpler. You know, we have a much, much more complicated cortex. So, what, well, you know, play is the simple form of joy. But in, in regards to, you made the statement, all mammals, is there an equal intensity level of these emotions like a, a core or basic level of, well, of the these core is, emotions in all mammals. You can take any mammal and you can breed it for low fear or high fear. And there's a standard test for that called a startle test where you put them out in a little arena and you might have something like an umbrella suddenly open. How much does the heart rate go up? How much do the stress hormones go up? And how much does he run around in the open field arena? You know, so, it, so you can have a low fear animal that's very non-reactive and you can have a high fear animal. You can, you can breed them, either high fear or low fear. You can breed an animal to be high separation anxiety or low separation anxiety. There's, there's a lot of uh, range in there, even like, let's take dogs, for example. There's a lot of range, you know, between high fear and low fear. You know, it's variable. It's very variable in people. Okay, let's take post-traumatic stress syndrome in people. If you have 20 Iraqi veterans that all went through the same awful thing, only two get PTSD, get post-traumatic stress. The others don't. You see, because some people react more, they get more scared when all the bad stuff happened than other people. So, and even in human beings, uh, the intensity of emotions varies. And one other thing, um, physiologically, as you go lower in the animal kingdom, say with birds, fish, reptiles, right, are there fish other core... Reptile, other fish and reptiles, you're getting, you're getting into twilight zone there. Um, uh, birds, uh, one thing, when it comes to intelligence, there's a lot of very, very interesting research done by Nicola Clayton out at uh, UC Davis, uh, where, uh, you know, the corvids, the crows, and the jays are very intelligent about knowing when another bird is watching them hide their stuff, and they wait until that other bird's not looking, and then they hide their stuff. Uh, the, uh, the, the bird emotions are less well studied. But mammals, okay, the way the old experiments were done, you shove an electrode down into the rage center and the cat goes <laughs> That was done in the 60s. I studied that um, in the general psychology book in the 60s, except they called it sham rage or fake rage. It's not fake rage. You shove an electrode in the fear center and the cat went into rage. You can also go into the amygdala uh, of an animal, and um, if you destroy the amygdala, uh, you, can, you can get rid of all the fear responses in an animal. And when you stimulate, when epilepsy patients are being operated on, you stimulate the amygdala, you get fear responses in people. That's very, very well studied in, in, in people. I mean, that's how the original, you know, the original uh, experiments were done, was uh, you stuck an electrode down different parts of the brain, and you could uh, stimulate these, you know, core emotional, uh, core emotional systems. And, the research, it's all in the neuroscience literature. 
You know, this is one of the big problems we have in science, is that this literature hasn't gotten over into veterinary literature much. Uh, I, when I've written papers, I've been forced to call fear behavior ex excitement and agitation. I was forced to do that by reviewers. And I've got some papers on temperament and cattle, and that's what I had to call it. Uh, but if you look at the neuroscience, you know, fear circuits. Oh, there's hundreds of papers on fear circuits. Hundreds of them. Look up Joseph Ledoux. Joseph Ledoux. L-E-D-O-U-X. He's got, and I got a lot of, uh, you look at the reference lists in Animals Make Us Human and Animals in Translation if you want to look up the literature. Thank you. But I'm not going to say that animal emotions are exactly like human emotions. And as you go down, a dog is more complex socially, uh, you know, than a, than a mouse. I mean, it, you know, get a bigger brain. And, but if, I'm not going to say a dog's a person. I mean, we've got a cortex that's ten times bigger than a dog. I'm back on the farm. Uh, most animals raised for meat are raised in confinement now. Could you comment on the animal welfare issues surrounding the amount of space these animals need and the need for mobility? Well, beef cattle, regardless of whether they go to Tyson or go to Whole Foods, the um, mama cows and the calves start, uh, the mama cows live out on pasture the whole time, regardless of where the cattle end up. And the calves spend at least half their life on pasture and then go to feed yards. You know, they, most of the pigs are indoors. Uh, and there are a lot more and more dairy cows are getting kept indoors, you know, full time. And, you know, you take something like a freestall dairy, you've got to make sure it's well, really well managed so you don't get leg lesions. You know, then you get into controversial things like sow gestation stalls where the sow is spending most of her life where she can't turn around. And I did a little survey and I found that two-thirds of the public doesn't like that. And I did that survey on United Airlines. And then... <laughs> I let United Airlines computer pick out a focus group participant sit next to me, and then there were, there were two other scientific studies done, very proper scientific surveys done, two-thirds don't like them, and Prop 2 in California passed by two-thirds. You know, there's, a th there's kind of an ethical barrier there where an animal um, isn't able to um, turn around People don't like that. I mean, I talked to one guy, he goes, well, I wouldn't put my hunting dogs in that thing. Well, intuitively, that seems obvious to a lot of people. Have you done, are, there, are there physiological studies of stress? Well, if you look at on the, animals, let's look at sow stalls. Or and in cattle look, and feedlot. And well, cattle field. and feed yards, if, it, if they're done right, they aren't a mud pit. But cattle and feed yards can be done fine. Now, I mean, there's a concern about, well, if they live their whole life on grain, they die. That's right. But you know what? Cattle love to eat grain. It's like feeding them cake, cookies, and ice cream, and they come running for it. You know, it's, uh, no, it's not a healthy diet, but they like eating it. <laughs> you know, I think there's other, I don't think welfare would be the main reason for not feeding grain. There'd be other, other reasons for, the only reason why grain is fed to cattle is it's dirt cheap. There's no other reason. And as long as grain is dirt cheap, it'll get fed to livestock. The thrust of your argument seemed to be that animals are more like humans than we suspect. But when humans are doing nasty things to other humans, we often don't want those humans on the receiving end to be calm. Are there circumstances you can envisage where you wouldn't want animals to be calm when they're having nasty things done to them? Wait a minute, I don't understand. Wait a minute. You're well, I'm a thinking little bit of, too abstract here for me. Um, Think, think of the Nazi Holocaust. One of the, the, the horrible things about it was that the Nazis calmed down the humans they're about to kill. Your, part of your argument seems to be it, it's good to have calm animals when they're about to die. So you could make an argument. I'm just wondering, is well, that always I, the case? Well, I, um, I, you know, maybe I'll, you call me a speciesist, but I, I, I think the Holocaust is the worst thing that, that people ever did. Now, I got to thinking, why is that the absolute worst thing that people ever did. And I thought about this as I walked through the Holocaust Museum. And when I saw the uh, model of the gas chamber, 
25 years of concrete and steel construction knowledge went into my head of, if I was forced to work on this, how could I sabotage this project? Big form, blow it outside, you know, mix up the concrete too much and weaken it. And one of the reasons why it's the worst of the worst is because business people were involved. Railroads, concrete companies, contractors, uh, no other genocidal thing were commercial business people involved in just killing human beings. And I do make a difference. I will not use my knowledge to kill people. I got asked flat out by Don Brum at, um, in, in England, he's an animal welfare specialist, why don't you fix the electric chair? This was about 10 years ago and there'd been a big screw up with the electric chair with smoke coming out of the guy's head and everything. I go, yeah, I know how to fix the electric chair. I know exactly what's wrong with it. I know how to fix it, but I don't cross that line. I don't have anything to do with that, killing people. And, and I, um, <laughs> well, I've been called a Nazi for, you know, designing slaughterhouses. You know, people that are animal rights abolitionists, they call me a Nazi. And, I thought, well, maybe I'm going to have to respond to, you know, this accusation that I'm a Nazi because I build slaughterhouses. And I did a lot of thinking about these things. And there's, this, there's a biological thing about animals, all animals, ourselves included, is that lions in certain situations, you know, the male lion may eat the cubs the, so they make the female come back into estrus. But he may eat a few cubs, but lions don't eat lion for the majority of the calories. They're going to eat antelopes and impalas and things like that for the majority of their calories. Each species kind of, you know, protects its own. Now, you might call that racist. That's not racism because um, racism is within a species. You know, they, uh, but you can call me speciesist. I don't cross the line. And uh, I feel very, very strongly that animals have to have a decent life. And after I designed one of my big slaughter systems, I watched all these cattle. This was back in 1990, going through this chute. And I got to thinking the cows would have never have lived otherwise. But we've got to give them a decent life. That I feel very strongly about. And there are some problems in certain intensive systems that need to be improved. It's just that simple. But I do make a line. I, I don't kill my own kind, period. Singer's writings, the other author I'm not, um, I'm not familiar with. And, you know, what I try to do is fix things out in the world in a practical way. I'm a very, very practical um, person. I'm, you know, some people just get very emotional. They just can't stand to look at it. And one of the things, that being working on slaughterhouses, and I'm not going to call them some other prettified term. I'll call them slaughterhouses. I'm getting more and more where I'm going to use that S word. I'm not going to call them murder factories. I'm not going to call them that. I'm going to call them slaughterhouses, slaughter plants. Um, is, uh, oh, my God. Now I just I lost my train of thought there. Well, the abolitionists, so most of them are going to have to agree to disagree because they're going to just call me a Nazi. Basically, I am a reformer. I want to fix the industry, not get rid of it. And I... Um, you know, I noticed that there's, you know, the other thing is being totally a vegan. I'm not talking about vegetarian and vegan. It's not very natural. You've got to take artificial vitamins, supplements, and stuff like that. One of the things that working on um, slaughter plants has done for me is make me think about my own mortality. I mean, every day I think, well, tomorrow we get in a car accident or the plane could crash or I could get, uh, you know, some you know, meningitis and croak from that. Um, that when I get old and die or maybe get young and die, that have I done something that, that actually improved things. I do a lot of work, you know, with people with autism. You know, the movie is going to show um, uh, Dr. Carlock. He got his honorary doctorate in the movie, and he was a NASA space scientist. And one of the things I get very choked up with is I found out the movie actually had a real Mercury space helmet on the movie set, and the 
Dr. Carlock, David Straffing got to hold that? Oh, Mr. Carlock would have loved to have had that. See, I get really choked up about that sort of stuff. But doing something to make improvement. I don't think making an all-world vegan is going to work. We're going to have to do some pretty artificial stuff. And the soybean isn't all, uh, it's got tons of hormones in it. And to take the hormones out of the soybean, and since I've been here and been eating some vegan stuff, I'm in a little soreness right here. I'll be, um, uh, from the hormones, I'm very, very sensitive to it. To take those hormones out of the soybeans will require biotechnology. Probably won't be doable with plant breeding. You know, they, the thing is, uh, I'm, the way I look at things, I'm working in the practical world, how can I do, make things better? Okay, how did I end up in slaughterhouses? I failed the grad record exam in math. I couldn't get into vet school. I had to go into a field that had no barrier of entry, you know, where you can just start at the bottom and work up. And then there's the lady over there with a the black. How did I get, maybe the battery died. All right, well, yeah. And then I'll talk to people individually if they want to talk. This dachshund that our next door neighbors had used to eat her own poop and then she'd come and lick you and <laughs> yuck. Uh, sometimes there's, I think there's some nutritional things with that. And I'm not an expert in nutrition, but I have heard there are some nutritional things on, you know, dogs eating their own poop. You try them and they don't work. Um, what, I mean, I'm not a big fan of a whole lot of aversives, but this might be something where you take a bite out of a turd, you slap them because there's some things you just don't want them to do. And, and, and I, I want to do things positive, but sometimes there's things that I want this to absolutely stop. And it's, if you want to read a really, really, really gross description about dogs eating poop, you can get the book Merle's Door. And it's about a dog, a free, you know, really wonderful dog that um, some hunters adopt. And when they're out, um, out hunting and canoeing, they had an old ammo box that they kept, they put their poop in so they wouldn't leave it out in the campground. The dog ate the whole box. <laughs> and then he jumped in their boat and started licking them. <laughs> okay. Now I'm visualizing that right now. I'm also smelling it now. Oh, yuck. Yuck. You know, it's one of those ammo boxes where you can really lock the lid down. They thought that maybe <laughs> that he couldn't get into it. But. Well, you know the thing on the vegan thing, I think there's genetic differences. I've tried going on a vegan diet. I cannot do it. And I think there are genetic differences in the ability to tolerate a vegan diet. Like, for example, in Asians, I think there's some extra genetic things where they can tolerate the uh, high-carb diet. Um, I get all hypoglycemic and lightheaded, and I can't function unless I eat animal protein. In fact, I had an attack today because lunch came late, and I couldn't wait to get into two hard-boiled eggs. To... <laughs> for some people, yes, there are, there are, for genetic people, for some people, I think, can do it just fine. But I can tell you, I'm not one of them. 